earthquake in 2008 in China. And since then has continued her work in um, community engagement. Maria Celeste is the program manager for CCCM and DTM in IOM Somalia. Prior to this, she prior to this, she had worked in Cox's Bazaar, where she supported the response of the Rohingya emergency and focused on women's participation project in emergency preparedness and response. Her background is in humanitarian action, gender studies, and forced migration and refugee protection. We will be beginning today's webinar with a short presentation by Vivienne, which will be followed by a video pre prepared by IOM Somalia on the preparedness measures being conducted following, and that will be followed by remarks by Celeste. After that, we will open up for a Q&A panel discussion where we'll have Julie Langlier, the Humanitarian Director of Internews in South Sudan. Over to you, Vivienne. Great, thank you very much. I'm gonna quickly uh, turn on my video. Hi, so you can all see me for a moment and then I will switch it off to not um, uh, challenge our uh, internet con uh, connection too much because I know it's not the best uh, everywhere we, we are. Um, I would like to start by first of all, thanking all of you to taking some time to join this webinar. I know everybody is super busy with COVID-19 and um, trying to adapt the ways that we work. I would like to start with a really short um, poll and um, then would ask you some thoughts about that. So we will actually start with a mini discussion and then I'll do the presentation and we'll have more time for uh, a discussion afterwards. So um, I'm just going to share my screen with you. And um, this means that uh, you should see a blank screen now that gives you instructions on how to uh, answer these questions. So please, can I ask you all on your phone or on your computer, go to polev.com. Um, slash Viviana Lucia 340. So it's the, um, the, the uh, website up there. And um, then uh, we have one question um, that we start with, which is uh, what does community engagement or participation mean to you? And I would like to ask you to give a one word answer. Um, so if it's two words long, then you will have to um, merge it into one because otherwise it will not uh, show up as one, one answer. Um, so please just go to, um, to uh, yeah, polyp.com. Great, we're already seeing feedback dialogue. You can also click on other people's um, uh, terms if you want to. Equity, agency, right? Dialogue, inclusion, agency, dignity. Yeah, feedback is getting bigger. Accountability, safety. Very good. So we can see that feedback, accountability, dialogue are some of the key key points. The bigger uh, the words are, the more people have. Um, have actually uh, chosen the same one. Resilience is another one. Cohesion, uh, engagement, equality, tailored to needs, yeah, meaningful communication. Very good. Um, that uh, those are all really good points, I think. Um, and I will I will touch on pretty much all of them during the presentation. Um, the next question for you is, uh, what is your main challenge to engage communities during this time of COVID-19? And again, it's a one word answer and you can vote on the different answers. Distance, time, technology. self-isolation, accessibility, yeah. 
remote engagement. So we have quite a few that relate to each other in terms of um, you know, be, not being able to go to places. Okay, anything else? Um, I'm going to see what else we have. Technology, ownership of any activity, self-isolation, lack of internet access, fear, time, misconception, access, education, physical distancing, technology, distance, access. We don't have information ourselves, government, reaching needs, unresponsiveness, language. So I think um, we've used a kind of different words to say similar things. So definitely distance, uh, remote work is a huge issue that relates also to access, relates to self-isolation, um, access again, physical distancing, distance access those are all similar. I think what stands out um, is language, uh, unresponsiveness. Um, technology, I think, can also relate to, to access and education to a certain extent as well. Fear is, of course, a really key thing. People are afraid of, um, of COVID-19 as well. That uh, influences how we how we react. And now I would like to ask you the last question, which is how long would you like my presentation to last? And no worries, this is uh, completely anonymous. So uh, you can be super honest and say, you know, five minutes. Um, okay, so everybody is playing it safe and going for the middle way with 76% who say 35 minutes long. Okay, great. So. Uh, 35 minutes long. Now, um, what I would like to, to ask you now, and this is the first uh, interactive part, and I'm gonna stop sharing the screen and hope you all remember that the majority of you said that I should talk for 35 minutes, the, do the presentation um, for 35 minutes. Um, so I would like to ask you um, what, do you think about this last poll? Uh, was that participation? Asking you that question. You can, um, it's probably easiest if you uh, write in the chat box because we're really a lot of people on this call. Um, but my question to you is, having done uh, the poll, do you think that uh, this is participation? Okay, yes to a degree, yes limited participation. No, ideally it would have said 20 minutes. Uh huh. It was an unfair question to some degree. Yes, somehow, somehow. Okay, so we have um, a little bit of uh, disagreement, which is great. Um, and I think uh, that's absolutely right. So there's participation to some degree, right? I've asked you for your input, but I've actually only let you choose options that I have given you. So you couldn't say 20 minutes or you couldn't say, actually, I don't want this part, you know, I don't want you to talk at all. Of course, you could hang up in this point, but um, you also can't say, no, this should be longer or shorter. Um, I want something else. So I think the last um, answer by, by Tom, limited to way communication, I think is quite accurate. Um, and this is, uh, of course, uh, a really good example, I think, of what we often tend to do. We ask questions um, where we decide uh, what we want to know from people and we don't necessarily give the space for the people we work with to actually say and set the agenda themselves. The other thing is, of course, that um, asking you this question, if now I go on and talk for uh, 70 minutes anyway, uh, then what is the point in having asked you? You will probably think, well, that was just a silly gimmicky thing. And I really don't feel like um, going to a webinar by this woman again, which would be completely understandable. So this is just a little example of um, how you know participation is more than just asking for 
input on preset uh, questions. And um, with that, I would like to start my uh, presentation. As the majority of you said 35 minutes, I will try to um, abide by that as well. And I'm setting my timer right now for um, 35 uh, minutes. Of course, some of you also wanted me to speak longer. Thank you very much. You don't get any credit for this because I can't see who said that. But um, we should be able to, to manage that time. So I will now share my screen with you once more and um, so that you can see the uh, presentation. And please note that I won't be able to see the, uh, or I might not be able to see the um, chat box. So uh, bear with me and there will definitely be time to, um, to answer questions and discuss towards the end. So um, as said before, my name is Viviane. I work for IFRC in Asia Pacific as the Community Engagement and Accountability Coordinator. Um, I've previously had the uh, pleasure of working with Internews in uh, Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh uh, for quite some time and um, with some other organizations as well, IOM a long time ago. Uh, so today I want to first talk a little bit about community engagement and participation, then uh, talk about how to address rumors that leads uh, links a little bit to uh, stigma as well. And um, then we come to the practical nitty gritty of how to engage communities in times of physical distancing. And um, I can tell you right now already that I do not have the perfect solution or a silver bullet, unfortunately. We're all trying to do our best and kind of uh, learning every day on how we can overcome this. Um, and then finally, I'll show you a little bit what kind of tools and resources are available that might be useful to you. I've seen the questions that you've sent in before and I've tried to address as many as possible in the presentation. Um, I hope you'll see that and find yourself in there, but uh, there is also space for a discussion afterwards because of course there's a lot of questions and um, our time is limited. So community engagement. I'm using the term community engagement, but um, it is definitely very much related to participation. Um, I don't want to get into the academics of participation and communication, uh, community engagement too much, but um, on the right hand side, you can see a small visual of the ladder of participation, which is a very old um, article uh, about different steps of participation that I find quite useful, where the first ones are non-participation, which in this case is just um, giving information. And that is what we're currently doing a lot. We talk a lot about hand washing, um, but, but not much else. Um, so that would be here a degree of tokenism, informing, consulting. Um, and then the real goal is, of course, that communities are in the driver's seat. So Arnstein called that citizen control in that case. Now, I don't fully agree with this because it's not as easy as having these different steps. Um, most of the time in just one program, we do a lot of these different ones. And ideally, we start by informing and um, you know, don't do the non-participation ones at all. But let's just try to see um, this as a multi-level um, approach to participation, where we start by informing um, people and being transparent, but where the ultimate goal is to really let communities drive the response. So why do we want to engage communities? Well, because we want them to participate in our programs. Um, we want to build trust and partnership with them and trust, especially in epidemics, is really a key point that we need to um, work on because otherwise people will not listen to us um, and will not share with us what, um, how they uh, see this response, what kind of solutions they have, and um, they will not, uh, engage in a partnership with us. It holds us accountable and makes sure that we listen to communities, that we um, involve them. It manages expectations and reduces rumors and misconceptions. 
and it helps us to be more accessible, to not do any harm, to be inclusive of different groups because it will show us who we're missing out on. It helps people access support and information they need and tell us what that is. And it also amplifies people's voices. Um, very often we tend to say uh, giving the voiceless a voice and things like that, but everybody has a voice already and communities we work with have a voice. It's just about giving them the right platform and amplifying that voice and recognizing their capacity capacity and their expertise. And especially in these moments where um, physical distancing is recommended, they are the first responders, not us. Um, it also increases sustainability because it means that people um, will possibly continue the work long after we've gone. Um, so what are the challenges? There is, uh, of course, decreasing face-to-face -face interactions possible. And I'm just talking here about the challenges in terms of risk communication and community engagement. There's obviously a lot more challenges that we face when we're looking at um, uh, camps, um, like crowded spaces, etc., access to healthcare and so on. But um, this is really, and this whole presentation is really very much focused on community engagement. So. Um, that's, that's why I'm limiting that here. Um, misinformation and rumors are uh, spreading fast and often faster than um, verified information. Uh, and of course, the geographical spread of this um, virus means that uh, everybody who's responding is quite stretched because there is almost no country that doesn't have any people with COVID-19. So community engagement for IFRC is kind of uh, three key points. One is um, ask first, message later, um, which means that we first want to ask people, um, what do you need? What do you already know? Uh, what, what solutions do you see? Um, and by people, I mean the communities we work with. And by communities, of course, we know that that is not a homogenous group, but that are lots of communities in one. Uh, feedback, um, we want to engage, document, address, and then adapt our program based on feedback. And we have to build trust uh, because it doesn't matter how much um, how much verified information and how many facts we have um, if people think that we don't care about what um, they're afraid of and what they're concerned about then it really doesn't matter how many great facts we have that are verified and with lots of logos um, we need to show that we take um, people seriously that we respond to what they're telling us so how do we build trust? Um, trust is really about actions rather than promises. And again, um, that's what, what I mentioned earlier, we want to ask first so that we can make decision-making more accessible and inclusive um, and uh, be open and transparent. So that means that we don't just share what we're doing, but also what we don't know. And that is really key in this um, response because this is a situation that is evolving very quickly and information is changing day by day. Um, so it means that this is of course also very confusing and it's quite hard to understand what is correct information and what isn't. Um, so we really need to also share the process of um, what we're doing and, and why there aren't answers to all the questions at the moment. We have to communicate frequently. Like very often we say nothing rather than saying we don't know. And it's really better to acknowledge that we don't know everything. People are usually quite reasonable about that um, when we explain why we don't know it and what we're, do what we're doing to um, find out more. Uh, but if we don't communicate, it um, creates this information or communication gap and um, this uh, gap or vacuum will be filled with, um, with often misinformation and misconceptions because people don't stop talking just because we don't talk to them. 
we have to link um, with each other because of course we can't uh, address everything. And um, once we are really open to questions and feedback from the community, it means that we need to um, have a system that, that uh, connects with each other. Uh, all of our communication should be easy to understand. And that doesn't mean dumbing things down, but it means making things familiar. And that can be that it's languages. Uh, so really using the languages or dialects that people speak at home, um, adjusting it to different education levels, to preferences for audiovisual and so on. It also means to use the cultural framework that people are are um, using themselves. So for instance, when we look back into other uh, epidemics, um, uh, SARS um, in Asia, for example, uh, people saw it as an imbalance of body heat. And um, that meant that, uh, of course, if we say, no, that's incorrect, it's a virus and that's how it works those people might not necessarily listen to us um, and they did indeed not listen but they went to traditional um, healers and um, did not always get the correct information to keep themselves safe so um, it's key to see what is the belief system of people and to to use that and that means um, including them in the decision making going to communities and saying okay these are the challenges what do you think how can we change that um, it's also about showing empathy and um, that's what i said earlier like showing that we care and um, addressing feedback and following up so both the ask first and the feedback and follow up is in bold because that is really um, the, the beginning and end of a, or you know, the two key steps of a cycle that we want to um, continue. So how to address rumors and misconceptions. Um, first of all, I'd like to invite you to um, not see rumors as a, uh, as something bad or as gossip but just as a piece of information um, there's lots of different rumors and they pose different risks and i'm not going to go through all the different uh, rumors here but just choose a few to um, to highlight this point and uh, you will get the powerpoint at the end anyway to look into um, some of the details a bit more so for instance uh, we have a rumor that migrants are bringing this disease and that of course causes uh, conflict or stigma or we have heard um, that uh, this disease like uh, COVID-19 is preventable if you eat a lot of garlic and ginger and of course that means that people don't take the other precautions that are necessary in order to keep themselves safe so there's a lot of different risks if we don't address rumors um, and stigma is one of them that I wanted to highlight a little bit because it came up in um, a few of the questions. Uh, there is also a longer guide on that that I've included here that you can look up. But um, one of the causes is, of course, the information gaps, like this is a new virus, we don't know everything yet, and people are anxious and want to know. And that means that they're looking for information actively and that comes from different sources that aren't always reliable. Of course, there are also underlying factors like prejudice and xenophobia. Um, and those are very hard to address uh, because that, uh, that is something that you know, takes a long time to address. But some of the key tips are to um, take these prejudices and anxieties seriously and rather than saying you're wrong that's stupid um, really looking at what are the questions behind these prejudices and trying to address those and showing people that you take them seriously so that um, they will continue in in a dialogue with us um, we uh, language really matters, so we shouldn't use a stigmatizing language like calling it the Wuhan or China virus. Um, and we also need to again engage like community leaders to talk about um, inclusion and talk about stigma and um, just troubleshoot together with them. Can also help if we uh, share stories of different people. Um, that are affected by COVID-19 to show that it really is something that uh, anybody can suffer from. 
Um, and also when we do messaging to make sure that we show different uh, people. And of course, it's much more likely that you're sending diverse messages if you have a diverse team that you work with. Um, ethical journalism is another thing and that doesn't mean that we have to do media stories but sometimes it's just about giving access to kind of uh, fact-checked information to media teams so that they have somebody that they can ask about these things. Um, so the first step is to listen and capture so establish a system to document community feedback and I specifically don't say document just rumors because really rumors are just another type of um, feedback and there's not a different system needed for that necessarily to collect them. Um, there's different uh, ways to do that and I will talk about how to do that in with physical distancing a little bit later. But some of the key things is that we um, should use local languages, which means we also need a team that speaks the local languages and dialects. Um, it should be open and unstructured because we want um, people to set the agenda. We want to not do what I did at the beginning to you, to just give three options. And then we hear, you know, what about the topics that we want to know about. Um, we need to make sure that we don't just ask the people who are the loudest, but also people who might be afraid to speak up. Um, and we don't just ask about rumors, we really ask, okay, what do you know already about COVID-19? What do you still want to know? And trust for that is critical because rumors are something that are very intimate. So that, that does require um, some training as well. Uh, understand the rumors is step two. So almost always rumors have a little bit of uh, truth in them. And um, it's good to understand what is correct and what is incorrect and check with in this case health experts mostly to understand um, the facts. We also um, have to speak to the community to understand more because sometimes it can really help to know the context of a rumor in order to be able to really address it. But when you do go back to understand that context it's really important as well to not just repeat rumors and um, therefore give them more authority, but um, to, to bring um, fact-checked information with you and to address questions as well. And the third step is to engage and respond. So um, always address rumors, don't be silent because again, if you're silent, that silence will be filled and that's often not with something positive. Um, if, we, if we don't address rumors, very often that is seen as confirming them. It's like, see, of course they're not um, talking about that because it's true. And so we really may need to make sure to always um, address rumors. That doesn't mean we have to repeat them. That means we have to find out what is the question from that rumor and how can we answer that. Um, it's not just about having the facts. It's also about making that actionable. If we tell somebody in a camp to wash their hands for 20 seconds with water and soap, but they don't have any soap, that is completely useless information. So that is also why we need to you know, keep in constant touch, of course, with the community as much as possible to understand what is the situation and what are solutions and also understanding what are solutions that communities have themselves um, and um, then using trusted communication channels so what are people already using to to share feedback and to get answers or where do you, they communicate um, using familiar languages as well and again, respecting the local customs and culture. And that also means understanding kind of the framework that people are using to explain, um, in this case, COVID-19. So when we address those, um, those rumors, we also need to make sure that people actually understand what we're saying. And um, one of the things that we should be doing is that actually all of our staff who engage with communities have um, a document that um, addresses the rumors that we've been collecting and hearing so that uh, they really can become kind of this these trusted information sources 
um, and also have the tools to answer some of the questions. And that shouldn't be um, well-crafted messages. That just needs to be easy to understand, familiar, using familiar words, and the kind of building blocks that people can use those to talk about um, these issues with communities. So uh, I just want to briefly show you this. I know it looks um, probably <laughs> a little bit uh, nerdy. Um, this is the um, feedback collection forms that we're using. They're part of the feedback starter kit and they've been translated into quite a lot of languages relevant for Asia Pacific, but also Arabic and French. And um, as you can see, except for the PowerPoint, the tools themselves are unbranded, so you're very welcome to use them and adapt them. And basically, they ask about the um, channel of how we've received the feedback, who, which volunteer has collected it, the location. It gives a little bit of a text that is a, a bit cut off, but um, no problem about uh, expectation management and consent. Um, then it has the sex and age range, age range because people often don't know how old they are and um, different groups of vulnerability. Um, and then we have the actual feedback and um, I filled this in already. So this is not a question that we're asking the community is COVID-19 transmitted through saliva, but this is part of the community feedback that we got. It's not the best example because it's very short. So um, when I took that feedback, I, um, I didn't really uh, you know, take the time to actually uh, listen well because it was in a training and not in a field um, context. Um, and then we can tick whether this is a sensitive feedback. So basically that means it's urgent and needs to be followed up and um, then we document what kind of answer we've given. Now, this looks like a paper form, but it's actually um, normally an ODK or a COBO form, so the um, open data toolkit that um, can be used for free to collect data mobile, so uh, on a phone or on a tablet. And again, you know, you're welcome to adapt this. Um, this goes into um, this Excel sheet, which also looks rather large, but uh, most of the parts you can just uh, copy paste from the um, from the Kobo or ODK form. And uh, in addition, um, it has this really simple Excel uh, dashboard, and that is um, showing you the total number of feedback and it gives you some of the kind of key uh, charts to understand what you've collected so far and to be able to res um, respond to that and again that is all available to you to um, use and to adapt and uh, the translations of the um, feedback form are in even more languages so we have uh, Bangla and um, Hindi, Myanmar, uh, lots of, I think, 11 different languages in total. And I'm happy to, to share all of them, of course. Um, choosing channels. So a good channel should be locally available and trusted and accessible. It's really important that the, the burden of work is not on the community to get in touch with us, but on us. And of course, one size does not feel all. Um, if we just think for a moment where you like to get information and where your uh, grandma, for instance, likes to get information, that's probably quite different. And that's the same in any kind of community. Different people have different preferences. So we should always use different channels to communicate and to collect feedback and address rumors. And we always need to ask who is not included in this who is missing out. And of course, it's also about the capacity and resources. There's no point in opening um, three different social media channels if actually we don't have enough people to manage them. So how do we engage in times of physical distancing? Um, this cartoon I quite liked from uh, the New Yorker in the CDC's recommended distance to view today's cartoon. So what do we do if we can't rely on face-to-face -face communication? Um, and how do we include vulnerable and marginalized groups? Um, first of all, 
I've, uh, you know, the most useful thing I think is to remember some of the questions and then try to find answers because of course I can um, give you some, some tips. However, you know, there's people from so many different countries on this call that, um, you know, a lot of this is really very much dependent on context. For instance, in, in Bangladesh, in Cox's Bazaar, um, we know that uh, mobile phones officially aren't allowed, so that is not going to be an option. Whereas in some other countries, that might very well be a great option get, to get in touch with people. Anyway, so marginalized and vulnerable groups. There is a um, guide as well that, again, I've included the link in if you want to know more about this. But basically, we need to ask us um, a couple of questions to, to understand. So who are the people who are marginalized and vulnerable? And of course, the first answer is usually older people, people with disabilities, um, people who, um, uh, women, for instance, um, and it depends, of course, on the context. But then let's look a little bit more granular. So what about LGBTI? Q, um, what about uh, people that um, are in a camp but from a different uh, cultural background, for instance, that might not have a network within the camp even, um, and asking them, going back again and asking, uh, what communication channels do you trust, do you prefer, um, and what kind of solutions do the group suggest? So it's really about not just us coming up with solutions and bringing them to people, but going to communities and saying, so this, this is the information we can give you about COVID-19. These are the challenges we are all facing. What do you think? What solutions are there? And that can be through um, existing community committees, because I know often camp management is already really good in having these committees. So tapping into those, but also looking, who are we missing out and not relying just on community leaders? Um, so that is also why we want to know um, which partners work with uh, marginalized and vulnerable groups already and make sure that we learn from them and that we use um, the trusted uh, relationship that they have already hopefully built up. Um, so asking how do people want to participate what solutions do they see is really one of the key things that um, we have to do. So moving from face-to-face -face interaction to what? Again, this um, there is no silver bullet, as I said, and I wish I could give you a really uh, simple um, answer here. But um, one of the things that uh, would definitely be useful is pre-positioning phones and tablets, for instance, and also radios um, with community groups, uh, because once, you know, in, we're in some countries now in situations where there, there's such strict movement restrictions that basically we cannot do face-to-face -face work anymore. So um, for in those moments, everybody <laughs> kind of wishes that they had pre-positioned some of these things already and told people on at this time, um, at this hour, there will be a radio show where we answer questions and this is the hotline that you can call, for instance. Um, we also should map which other activities still take place and use those to engage. Quite often we have like a community engagement team who does their own activities, but if we're handing out masks, for instance, then why not use that moment to, to uh, collect feedback, to share messages? And of course, we need to train our volunteers to do that safely. So keeping distance, not encouraging mass gatherings um, and so on. There are, of course, a lot of um, social media platforms and messenger apps around. Um, and uh, one thing that has been working in some cases was uh, setting up messenger groups, um, not just for our volunteers, but also for um, people from the community. And that can either be, be through uh, like WhatsApp business where we can share like lots of uh, messages with people, but can also collect, can do mini polls, etc. But it can also be for our community volunteers. And if that's not the case already, the volunteers should 
definitely come obviously from the community we're trying to support because those are the people that you know we will be able to stay in touch with more easily going forward um some uh red cross red crescent societies have been using tiktok as well to engage so for those who know don't know it it's like a, a platform where you can do little videos people can comment on it swipe through it and it's um extremely popular with uh um, some people facebook isn't bad either especially when we're using something like facebook live where people can ask questions and they're being um, answered live and if you do that definitely um, make sure to also capture the questions that people are asking and um, just uh, you know do a little uh, frequently asked question thing afterwards after the uh, session is over twitter i mean there it really depends on where where you're working what is the platform that is relevant and I'm also of course well aware that in a lot of camps that's not necessarily an option but um, we also do know that uh, people always find ways to um, get their hands on a phone if it's possible at all and um, yeah in addition we have a website uh, that's uh, from ifrc the virtual volunteer which is an app that people can download right now that is specifically targeted at uh, migrants and overseas workers from the philippines and um, that has information about for instance italy iceland colombia and sweden a rather random collection of countries but basically it's an app that people can download and where they um, can, for instance, find out where they get can get more information, some basic questions, and they are sharing information about COVID-19 as well. Um, so that's, I'm not recommending that necessarily as a website because it's really specific to those countries. So unless you're there, that's not gonna be very useful but it might be useful to have a look at it and see if that could be kind of a template of um, you know, a, another way to engage people. Um, for the, if social media is not as much an option, then doing something like, um, for instance, call in radio shows and um, can be really useful. And with that also making sure that we talk about um, talk also to communities there um, that can be through text lines and call-ins etc and um, having kind of uh, you know health people answer questions and um, also not being afraid to use somebody who speaks the local language so it doesn't need to be the the most important expert it needs to be somebody who understands of course the facts but um, sometimes it can be really great to have like a community nurse if they're well informed um, local hotlines and really it's key that they're local because um, of language again and also what we are planning to do is for instance doing a perception survey where we do the survey through the phone and we call our volunteers and they are of course all community members themselves and they answer the survey plus um, two of their family members because right now a lot of people are of course confined to be with their family um, and uh, this can be another option but again like this really depends on the context and it's something where it's really worth going back to the community and asking them what solutions do you see what can we do and partially it's a of course also about doing advocacy to for instance allow internet um, access in camps as much as possible and understanding that yes this is really limited and we need to be very creative and start a lot of different channels to to try and you know have some that that work and adjust them accordingly um, so just quickly the resources and tools um, so there's a, a lot of them I've listed some that I thought might be more useful to you so the feedback star ticket is one i showed you the collection form and the excel dashboard there's a lot of other information in there as well and it links to other resources too um, there is a guide on how to address and prevent stigma um, in terms of covid 19 um, there's the interim guidance of uh, scaling up in 
which also includes um, camps and camp line settings. Um, probably a lot of you know that already. There is a guide on including marginalized and vulnerable well, people that also talks about camps a little bit, but also talks in general about different groups and why they're vulnerable and how to include them. And in addition, there's a uh, discussion points for community workers that um, is still geared kind of to face to face interactions, but can also be transferred to, to other um, channels as well. Um, we're working on a rapid assessment tool that also is going to have advice on how to collect this kind of data when we can't do face-to-face -face communication. And there's a guide on how to use social media for COVID-19 as well. Um, you can find all of these resources um, here. So there's a community engagement hub by the British Red Cross that has all of these um, and uh, in addition, there is an interagency Google Drive for those colleagues that are in Asia and the Pacific. Um, but it might be useful for, for colleagues in other countries or regions as well, because um, some of the documents there are uh, you know, not region specific. So that's another great place where there's more and more documents coming in and if you want to add your resources you're very welcome there's a inbox folder on the google drive um, which is being managed by uh, bbc media action so in summary there is no simple solution we have to ask first we have to um, ask communities what do they need um, what uh, how can they um, uh, find solutions and support those solutions um, we have to use multiple channels and link up with others and we have to check back often to understand really what, um, you know, if what we're doing is useful and how we need to adapt it. So um, this is it from me and this is my uh, timer, which means um, that uh, I was uh, exactly on time with 35 minutes as uh, most of you have requested and apologies for the few brave ones that said I should only talk for 10 minutes and um, the other brave ones that said I should talk for uh, 60 minutes. Um, I hope I addressed uh, some of your questions already and um, I'm looking forward to also when we discuss uh, later kind of to hear what is your experience and have you found any ways that have uh, worked really well and that others should uh, take on and please do feel free to get in touch of course that's it from me thank you so much vivian um so once you un can you unshare your screen um i think okay. it should be unshared now <laughs> ah perfect thank you so much thank you so much vivian for the presentation i think we've all learned uh, definitely um, a lot more from your presentation. Right now, we are going to watch a video that has been prepared by IOM Somalia on uh, the preparedness measures that they have taken um, to address COVID in their camps. Uh, can you all see the... Yeah. Cannot hear. Sorry? I cannot hear. I'm not There's sure. No volume. Okay, hold on. Sorry, just give me one second. Let me try this again. Now? No. No. No, I can't oh. hear either. Oh, okay, one second.
my name is Hassan Mohamed Gabo. I work with IAM Somalia Mission in the Department of Camp Coordination and Camp Management in Doro. Uh, as I was As I am speaking, currently I am in Kapasa IDB site, one of the largest IDB sites in Dolo. Uh, the COVID-19 affects everyone. There are more than 2.6 million displaced persons and 2,000 IDB sites in Somalia. If coronavirus spreads in the region, thousands will die. Overcrowding, weak health services, and lack of information make these IDBs exceptionally vulnerable to the pandemic. Preparation is not an option, it's a must. CCCM in Somalia has been leading the efforts in raising awareness of coronavirus, including its symptoms and ways to stop it. We are working with many partners, including our health staff and the Ministry of Health to train our frontline staff as well as community leaders and community mobilizers on key messages and proper hygiene practices. For the awareness trainings, we are doing social distancing. Everyone sits one meter apart and less than 10 people in one room. We have designed a poster in Somali, English, Oromovic, and Amharic for key messages related to the coronavirus. The posters are displayed in community centers, entrances to the sites, and key migration routes. In case the message don't reach everyone, we are also using mobile teams. They use megaphones and cars to share the messages with everyone. If situation gets worse, we will use our mobile teams with megaphones on cars to share messages so that we ensure social distancing. We will also change our complaint and victim mechanism desks to a hotline phone number. Coronavirus is everywhere and affects everyone. IOM and all CCM partners must work together to make sure that even the most vulnerable populations will be safe.
Okay, over to you now, Celeste. Thank you. I hope you can hear me now. I'm trying to share video, but I don't think it's working. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. Okay, so I will share some things of what we're doing in the field. I will try not to repeat too much what was already in the video. Um, first of all, I'm very glad that we have such a big audience today and people joining from different parts of the world. Uh, to put this in context, in Somalia, as Gabo was sharing in our video, there are more than um, 2.6 million IDPs uh, who are living uh, in more than 2,000 IDP sites. So uh, here in Somalia, about 1.8 of the of the million IDPs are actually living inside, while the rest of the IDPs are living within the host community. Um, the video is from Dolo, a place where there are two big IDP sites, but for the rest of the country, uh, we actually see small IDP sites that are spread in towns. For example, in Baidoa, there are more than 400 IDP sites, which makes the work from CCCM perspective uh, way more challenging, especially in the terms in the times of coronavirus. Um, also, to mention that uh, despite the, now we are working in the context of coronavirus in Somalia, there are different types of emergencies that are interacting all the time and that make our our job uh, very very challenging. Uh, for example, now we are transitioning at the end of the drought that affected Somalia since 2016, and what we see now it's an irregular pattern of rains which uh, results in flooding and we're entering now the rainy season. On top of that we're seeing a low-cost invasion which is depleting all the food in the country which also adds a different level of complexity and of course uh, Somalia is still a country that is witnessing an armed conflict which makes access to a lot of areas very very difficult and which means that we still uh, see internal displacement uh, in parallel to the other emergencies. Um, so from a camp coordination and camp management perspective, I think one of the, of the key things that we do and that we work in is coordination. And this has been key to, to work in, term, in times of coronavirus, especially because as I was mentioning in many of the towns where we work, there are hundreds of IDP sites. So it's very difficult to cover them all. And we as CCCM would not be able to do it alone. So it's very important that we're working with partners from health, from WASH, the local authorities, the Ministry of Health at the local level, we are all working together and we are meeting regularly to make sure that all the messages that we deliver to the community are in line and that uh, we, we do the best that we can in the limited time that we have. Uh, so one of the first steps that was taken from CCCM and from other actors working in the field was to train our frontline staff. We have a lot of community mobilizers who are the core of our team and who are doing most of the job in terms of communicating to communities uh, what's the situation and how they can mitigate the risk of coronavirus. So the first step was training and then after that we started especially working with the community leaders. We are very lucky to have very strong community leaders here in Somalia who are very proactive in communicating to the rest of the, of the habitants of the sites. Uh, so we organized uh, trainings or awareness sessions at the community centers. As you could see in the video, uh, one of the challenges is that we cannot have many people in the same uh, space for obvious reasons. So we are limiting these meetings for up to 10 participants at any time. And we are asking them to keep one meter distance at a minimum. So the sessions usually start with information sharing, with demonstrations about how to properly wash their hands. And there is also space to, to discuss rumors and to try to, to um, share with them which of these rumors are actually based on accurate information and which ones are not. Um, so aside from this uh, work with the community leaders, we're also conducting awareness sessions at the IDP sites with the rest of the community. And as you could see in the video, we also have outreach teams which are working with um, megaphones uh, so as not to do door-to-door -door -door awareness, which of course is not, it's not possible uh, due to coronavirus. Uh, also, we are working with local authorities and with other partners to mobilize vehicles and to disseminate uh, messages from the vehicles so that way we can keep good uh, distance between 
the community mobilizers and the and the rest of the community and also it helps us cover big areas as as i was saying there are so many idp sites that it would be very difficult for us to cover them all if we didn't work uh, with these modalities um, in terms of how we can also do a two-way communication with the community well first of all in these awareness sessions of course there is time for the community members to also share their thoughts share what what they know what they think and the challenges that they are facing but also one of the key things for camp coordination and camp management is to to be able to operate our complaints and feedback mechanism even in, in times of coronavirus uh, now as you know in times of an emergency it's very normal or Unfortunately, uh, we always see that the marginalized communities uh, often uh, get discriminated against and cannot access uh, limited services. Uh, it's very likely that some of the services that are provided now are going to, to be halted or are going to, to be challenged in, term, in times of, of the outbreak because of logistic uh, constraints. Uh, so we need to ensure that the, that the most vulnerable communities and that the, the most vulnerable individuals have a way to express if they are facing challenges at accessing uh, life-saving services. So for us, it's very important that the community feedback and complaints mechanisms are still operating. At this time, we are doing it from the community centers that we have, uh, but we're also um, evaluating uh, moving to a hotline uh, at this time, we are still able to access the sites uh, only for the most urgent activities, as are all the activities related to coronavirus. Um, but we know that at some point, it's very likely that the government will uh, impose some mobility restrictions. And at that time, we will have no option but to move to a hotline. Um, now, this, of course, is not the preferred option from the community based on our, on our experience. Uh, what uh, the Somali community prefers is face to face, is being able to, to talk to people. Um, but if that's not the option, we will have to, to move to more remote ways of, of working with the community. Um, now, in terms of using technology in, in times of coronavirus, um, in Somalia, we're lucky that a large number of the population have cell phones. Uh, unfortunately, the literacy levels are very low, uh, especially for women and for rural communities, and they are lower for IDPs than for, for the rest of, of, the, of the Somalis. So we, we do rely on being able to use phones uh, in case there is a lockdown in the country. Uh, for example, we could use phones and contact uh, community leaders to help us do some service monitoring and to make sure that the basic services are still available even during a lockdown. Um, but other types of communication, for example, uh, relying on internet or using WhatsApp messages or, or doing YouTube, Facebook, that's not an option for us because internet access is very limited in Somalia, uh, especially so for, for IDPs. Um, and even though cell phones are available, something that is not necessarily always available is electricity. Uh, so sometimes we think that because cell phones are available, we can rely on them. However, uh, we know that many community members have to go to the market to charge their phones. So to mitigate this, we're trying to install some solar panels at the community centers. So at least the community leaders have an, another option to charge their phones and to keep a communication line with the, the humanitarian community if we, if we enter a lockdown or if there are more mobility restrictions in place. Another thing that we are doing in anticipation of, of a lockdown or something similar is um, that we are procuring uh, megaphones to be prepositioned at the community centers. Uh, that have rechargeable batteries and this would be at the disposal of the community leaders in case the, the, the community mobilizers from the CCM team are not allowed to, to move around or to go to the sites for any reasons for their own protection or because these are um, restrictions put in place uh, we would rely more and more on community leaders to, to keep communicating with the rest of the community. Um, Monitoring rumors is something that is uh, extremely important at these times. As I was saying in the awareness sessions and in the trainings, we always ask the community what they think, what they have heard before. Um, you could see in the video that one of the most prevalent rumors in Somalia was that uh, non-Muslims were the only ones that were getting coronavirus. Another rumor that we hear a lot is that uh, 
in, in Somalia because it's very warm, coronavirus is not going to survive and that it only will happen in countries where it's colder. Um, obviously, that is not the case and that's something that, that we are addressing on our awareness sessions. Um, as a CCCM cluster, um, we have a system in place to collect information on awareness sessions that are being done by the CCCM teams uh, around the country. And we're also going to incorporate monitoring rumors in the same tool so that we, all the CCCM actors in the country, we can share with each other what are the rumors that we are seeing. And that way we can all adapt our communication um, based on the things that we are hearing from the community. So yes, basically um, we're having to adapt a lot of our activities, um, trying to keep social distancing, uh, but also thinking of how is going to be the situation once and if there are more cases in Somalia, once and if there is a community transmission, which is not the case yet. Um, so we are going to be relying a lot on, on the community themselves to continue much of the work that we were doing before with community mobilizers. Uh, the challenges are not being able to have a lot of people in the same place at the same time, which makes, of course, communication way more difficult. Um, ensuring the safety of our frontline staff is also a challenge. We have distributed sanitizer and soap for our own teams. However, of course, we need to, to measure um, the level of exposure that they have if they are working around in the community to the benefits of their work. So sometimes we might have to make difficult decisions and maybe uh, minimize some of the activities that we were conducting in the past or choose which activities are worth still um, conducting and which ones should be paused until the situation improves. Um, also monitoring activities remotely is a challenge. Uh, many of our team members are currently working from home. Um, for me, myself, I'm working from Mogadishu, whereas the, the teams are working in different parts of the country. So it is very difficult to monitor the, the work that is happening. Um, we are lucky that the, our team members do have access to internet, so they send videos regularly and pictures. And sometimes we see, for example, in the videos that social distance is not being kept and we can give feedback to each other because, of course, we are all learning together and even if we are trying to to preach social distancing to the community it's something that we ourselves have to have to be reminded of constantly until we incorporate this new habit um, another challenge is working against time as i was saying that now we have access to IDP sites and and the community mobilizers are still able to conduct sessions even if they are small sessions but these are still ongoing but it's very likely that once uh, there is community transmission in Somalia, uh, much of this work will have to, to change to even a more remote modality. So we are trying to work as fast as we can. Um, and then another challenge I would say that is conveying the, the seriousness of the situation uh, while not causing panic, right? We want people to take this very seriously because it is a very serious situation, but at the same time, we don't want them to, to panic. We don't want them to, to be scared or, or to run away or to, to act in irrational ways out of fear. So it's difficult finding the balance of uh, making sure that the issue is taken seriously enough and that they are following the recommendations while at the same time um, keeping calm and, and trying to to work together on this. Um, so yeah, I think that's the, the main points that we have to share from, from our experience here in Somalia. I will be happy to, to answer questions from, from the participants. Thank you so much, Celeste. Um, before we go into um, questions asked in the chat, uh, I just want to mention that we are running a bit late, so the webinar might end about 10, 15 minutes later. And now we will go to the Q&A session, which will be moderated by my colleague, Amalia. Over to you, Amalia. Thank you, Ash. Um, thank you very much to our uh, speakers uh, for the presentations. So um, as I mentioned earlier by Ash, uh, we have done a prioritization of the questions that we've received uh, from you. Uh, and we selected those that are more relevant to the topic of participation and, and the work of the working group and those that are also more related to the core responsibilities of um, camp management organizations. So um, for the Q&A sessions, we will count with the expertise from our speakers and we have also very knowledgeable resource persons in the participants like Julie from Internews South Sudan, 
but also we would like to know a bit more about um, the experiences and the challenges that uh, the rest of participants are facing. So please don't hesitate to uh, make any comment on the chat uh, related to the questions that will be discussed. Um, also, um, if you have any additional question, please write it in the chat. Uh, I can't commit that we can um, address it uh, today, but we will try to address it uh, bilaterally afterwards if it has not been covered by the session. Um, so a lot of the questions that we have uh, received are um, related uh, on how to adapt community, community engagement and participation activities to social distancing measures and also in some cases to the lack of access in sites uh, because traditionally this these uh, activities are done face to face but this is currently not possible uh, or is very limited in most part of the countries uh, at this moment so um the first question that uh, i want to throw to our colleagues is uh, from um, ground truth solutions uh, uk uh, we received a question uh, that said, when aiming to share information or collect feedback in hard to reach areas or in sites where access are limited, um, how to approach uh, remote management of these activities without uh, the community focal points uh, being exposed uh, to, the to the virus through the face-to-face -face interaction? And uh, if there's any lesson learned uh, so far uh, from, those, uh, from those preparations for this remote management. Um, I would like to have maybe Celeste and Julie to uh, address this question. Um, I'm going to also put it in the chat for better understanding of everyone. So um, over to you, Celeste. Yes, so for keeping our staff safe, it's the same recommendations that the rest of the community are following. It's keeping uh, social distance and also keeping good hygiene. We are following the same recommendations that WHO is, is sharing with everybody. Now for hard to reach areas, that's a very relevant question for Somalia. As you know, there is an armed conflict happening. So there are a lot of areas that are actually not reachable, especially not for us as IOM. Um, so this is not necessarily an activity that we would do as, as CAM management in, in areas where we have no access at this time. However, uh, from the government side and from other organizations that are also working on the response. Um, they, there have been other um, actions taking place to try to reach these areas that are completely inaccessible due to the armed conflict. So for example, some of the things that are being done is that uh, there are massive uh, SMS messages being sent to phones. And also when you make a phone call here in Somalia, while you're waiting for the person to pick up, you hear uh, an awareness session on coronavirus, which I think is it's quite smart and, and quite effective. Um, also, there are a lot of messages being sent uh, by radios uh, who people listen to, and there are, there are a lot of uh, messages going to them that are being developed specifically to, to be put on the radio. So these are some options that, uh, that are, are being put in place here. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm reading the question just to make sure I'm not uh, missing the second part. So the second part is about uh, remote uh, management without focal points exposing themselves. So yeah, so for the time being, since there is no local transmission or at least not local transmission that, that we know of, we are still able to do life-saving activities in the sites as our risk communication activities. However, once and if there are more cases in Somalia, and especially if there is community transmission, of course, these activities will have to be discontinued um, or to, to be readapted. For us, one of the things that we have in mind is, as I was saying before, having the feedback and complaints mechanism uh, turned into a hotline. Um, our community mobilizers can work from home and can answer the phone and take note of the feedback and the complaints and then the referrals can also be done by phone. Um, uh, some other uh, ideas that we have in mind is, for example, we have a good database of the community leaders and their phone numbers, so we could contact them uh, regularly to ask them how the situation is in the site and especially to monitor service provision and to make sure that they have a, a form, a, an easy way to, to raise any concerns and that this are uh, transmitted to the relevant partners. 
So that's, that's our, those are some of the ideas that we have in mind. Of course, we are learning by doing. So if anybody else has other ideas that we could incorporate, we'd be happy to, to hear. Thank you, Celeste. Um, Julie, do you yes, want to over to you? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, on an <clears throat> interview South Sudan perspective, just to uh, give you an idea of what we're doing, uh, we are uh, running for um, humanitarian radio stations uh, in camp settings, two in uh, POCs, Protection of Civilian Sites, uh, which are RDP camps, and two in refugee camps. Uh, those radio stations have uh, a, a coverage of uh, like a radius of uh, between 30 and 70 kilometers. Um, we have teams of uh, community correspondents who have double role. First, to uh, organize listening, listening groups um, and listen to feedbacks and rumors and, uh, and then uh, produce uh, audio programs responding uh, to those uh, feedbacks and rumors in collaboration with uh, uh, humanitarian agencies or service providers. Um, now, in the COVID context, uh, we are you know, looking at relying more on our uh, call-in radio shows um, to receive feedbacks and also uh, our community correspondents when they uh, travel outside of POCs and engage with the community. Uh, we have asked them to uh, keep con uh, the, the contact details of uh, the inter interlocutors so they can uh, keep engaging with them by phones. Those of you who know South Sudan, they, they understand that <laughs> um, phone network is not everywhere in South Sudan. It's not that reliable either. So um, we, we, our response will not be uh, perfect, definitely. Um, we are also uh, doing Boda Boda Tok Tok, so um, uh, speakers on uh, motorbikes, uh, narrow casting, um, inside and outside of camps. Uh, we are looking at um, planning how we can continue this activity uh, on with, uh, uh, if there's more cases in South Sudan and if restrictions will come up. Um, uh, but uh, we are, I will be, I'm, I'm interested in, in uh, listening to your uh, suggestions on this and ideas. Um, we are, you know, definitely talking about social distancing and when we do narrow casting, like those um, speakers uh, positioning in different locations, we are asking people not to gather uh, too close and to keep distance um, between each of them. Um, and for so far, uh, it's w working slowly. There there's no uh, cases in camps, uh, identified cases in camps uh, at the moment, so uh, the situation is still relatively uh, calm, uh, but it, you know, we expect that it's going to change soon. Hopefully not. Um, yeah, um, I think that answers. We are uh, also looking at um, recruiting new stringers in uh, new locations, uh, people who have access to uh, uh, internet and uh, who have uh, good phone connections to um, to record um, questions from uh, from the community uh, in specific areas, especially uh, points of entries uh, in South Sudan, which we are considering could be like a high risk area. Um, and also at positioning uh, speakers in those locations with pre-recorded uh, messages. Um, yep, so this is uh, the approach at the moment in, uh, for interviews in South Sudan. We are working closely with camp management uh, in Malakal and Bensu. And, and I'm, yeah, I'm very interested in listening to uh, the experts' uh, um, suggestions on that. Thank you. Um. Thank you, Julie. Um, I am reading on the chat. Um, so there was a there was a comment from Tom asking for thoughts on the, on ways to use local capacity to access the most vulnerable individuals when working remotely. So those individuals outside the, the established networks. Um, 
he says if the most vulnerable cannot be accessed, uh, then it's hard to build community resilience. So um, I would like to know if uh, maybe uh, Vivian or Celeste have any, any thoughts, any comments about this. I think it's pretty interesting. Yeah, um, that's the million dollar question, I think, that we all want the answer to. Um, what uh, you know, I've been trying to do is to, to establish these connections before there's any movement restrictions. Um, there are, of course, even uh, with movement restrictions, there are still some people going out and going to the community. And then as described by Julie and Celeste, I'm asking people to keep distances. And you can see it as well in the two pictures from IOM that uh, are on the presentation, right? Asking people to sit far apart. And it's the same when you know we go and um, talk to people that we uh, keep a distance and um, explain why we keep a distance. And um, I think it's hard to make kind of a general statement of um, mm -hmm. all older people um, can be contacted this way or can't be contacted this way. Um, of course, as uh, you know, one of the tools that I had mentioned and that Julie talked about more is um, radio that is more accessible where, um, you know, ideally if there's a phone network, people can call in. Um, there's also ways to um, do things with voice messages. So that can sometimes be easier for people in terms of literacy where they can leave a voice message and call back or where there is um, some pre-recorded information already. Um, where there are still some um, loopholes in the movement restrictions, it's about you know, trying to go and um, see how, how partners that work with uh, older people engage with them. If they have, you know, if there is anything in terms of phones available, um, if there is still any services that are happening and linking into those. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's a limitation, obviously, to what we can do and what technology can solve for us. So the best we can do is see what people are already using and trying to establish even the less popular ones, like, uh, you know, start the hotline now when you can still do face-to-face -face contact so that when you can't, you don't have to make it um, popular with people. Does that, that, does that uh, partly answer that question? Yes, thank you, Vivian. I think so. I think there's also a point on like a, this discussion, it's also related to the technology we use. Uh, like I think you advanced a bit on your presentation on what, what are the criteria we need to consider when choosing like one type of technology and from the participation point of view also the question we should ask, ask ourselves who is excluded from accessing these channels and also, what are the preferred options by the community? By the community, um, we had some questions really like asking for um, examples of use of social media and technology to engage with communities. Um, I think this probably, uh, like mentioned, uh, Celeste already mentioned, is not very relevant for uh, Somalia. I don't think it's the case for South Sudan. But if somebody from the participants has a good experience on that, please mention this in the chat, and then we'll read or we'll give you the the floor. Um, I think that we have seen and discussed a bit on uh, like different ways on how uh, operations uh, and community engagement activities can be adapted uh, to this social distancing and limited access. Um, I would like to reflect on one question that I think is central to this webinar, but also um, to the work of the Participation and Displacement Working Group. Um, in regards to the participation of women and girls and other traditionally marginalized groups, uh, such as people with disabilities. Um, so we got a question from colleagues from uh, IUM USA asking what practical steps can come management agencies can take to support and uh, encourage meaning, meaningful participation of women and adolescent girls and other traditionally marginalized groups like people with disabilities during the COVID response. So um, Vivian, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address this question to you and maybe if uh, Celeste and Julie and of course the participants have any, uh, any suggestion on that one, uh, it would be good to discuss. So over to you, Vivian. 
Thanks. Um, yeah, a really important point, of course. I think, again, it's about um, going to these groups, seeing who's already engaged with them, because we might, you know, once there are movement restrictions, it's very hard to build up trusted relationships. So if you can still do it, do it now. Um, and and looking into what are they using already to communicate and um, making sure that the information is relevant to them as well because we you know, we tend to do this blanket messaging and of course part of that is always going to be useful but um, there will be some very specific questions from these particular groups that um, you know you know, are important to answer and you know we we are already uh, hearing things about uh, for instance um, birth control other things that um, might be hard to come by if there's movement restrictions um, access to services etc so um, I think one of the things is to uh, kind of first map who are the groups um, what kind of communication tools do they have available and then try to make um, a specific effort to to address them so uh, making sure as well that um, you know community leaders understand that there's uh, different um, questions from different people and um, ensuring that for instance uh, this can be a good moment to to include um, women into uh, community committees or that we need they need to do a special effort as well to get in touch with them again i think quite often we see that uh, women also have less access to technology um, than men so pre-positioning some of that with women can be really useful if we do radio to make sure that there's also um, you know, specific time to um, talk to women and um, ensuring that that is uh, supported by men and not seen as um, a competition. Uh, so I think those those are some of the ways that we can go forward. Um, and again, like key are our community volunteers and really making a a big effort and I know that that is in some circumstances very hard to have um, women included in in our volunteer groups uh, because those are the ones that uh, will still be on the ground and whom we can possibly give something like a radio or a phone to to keep everybody updated on what the questions are yeah I think that's the yeah Thank you, thank you, Vivian. Um, Celeste, do you want to add anything on that on that topic? I think I mostly agree with Vivian, um, particularly in the fact that these relationships with the community, and especially with groups that are marginalized, have to be built way before an emergency like coronavirus strikes. At this time, it's extremely difficult if that system is not already in place mm -hmm. to put it in place. Um, so this is a time where we really see how good um, the connection between the humanitarian agencies and the community are. Um, I would challenge a little bit the fact that the women are per se a marginalized group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this changes a lot from context to co context. Yeah. And, and to be very fair, in Somalia, it's not so much the case. Uh, women are very outspoken. Of course, it's not all of them, but uh, women participation in Somalia is actually much more successful than in many other contexts and, and you see it in the in the video you see women speaking on the video and this is not just by coincidence or because we wanted to show a woman talking uh, we see it all the time and, and when you visit the sites and, and you meet with the, the, the community leaders you will always have women and they are not shy I would say that for example in the context of Somalia and, and I speak as an outsider this is not my country and I arrived six months ago um, but uh, marginalization comes more from the clan for example there are some clans uh, that are the majority in some areas and then if you belong to a minority clan that's when you might be excluded um, and we we have some anecdotal information on this only 
but in terms of uh, women uh, being excluded, that, that depends a lot on, from context to context. Now, for persons with disabilities, similarly, like if, if you don't have a good network before the emergency strikes, it's going to be very difficult to build it from one day to the next, especially if you cannot have uh, big gatherings of people. Um, we're trying to make sure that we reach the, the most vulnerable, but uh, this, this really has to, to be uh, a transversal thing for our operations. It's something that needs to be in place in the day-to-day -day work, especially for CCCM. If it's not, then when the emergency strikes, you're not going to be able to reach these communities. Um, thank you, Celeste, uh, and thank you also for challenging, challenging this uh, assumption that uh, women are always marginalized because we sometimes take things for granted and it's not the case everywhere. Um, so there was also a couple of questions related to um, how to engage with communities that have uh, cultural conceptions which are not in line with the messages that we uh, want to pass to the community through, uh, like for this response. Uh, so, context with high lit literacy rates or context with, context with cultural or religious beliefs might contradict these messages. So, um, the question that we got is like, what approaches can be taken to deal with different cultural conceptions um, of health or diseases in order to prevent the spreading of the COVID in the communities? Um, so, any of the colleagues, uh, the speakers, wants to address this question first? I'm, I'm happy to say a little bit about that. Um, uh, I'll, I'll keep it short. <laughs> um, I think that's a really good question and that's something that uh, we see. I mentioned that briefly that uh, one of the experience from previous epidemics is that um, you know, we need to use the cultural framework rather than ignoring it and just using our own. So step one is to um, have a team that is diverse to understand the cultural context in such a you know, diverse community because of course um, I'm for instance right now stuck in Malaysia there is uh, you know there's Ramadan coming up there's Easter holiday coming up and all is relevant so um, you know one community will have lots of different frameworks and lots of different people so um, being representative in our own teams is, is helpful but of course they are also not um, fully representative as one person of that community, but it definitely helps to make the connection to a certain extent. Um, the second thing is to um, ask again and bring the, the troubleshooting back to those communities. So for instance, in Papua New Guinea, um, one of the, you know, the, the rites um, that are done when people pass away have to do with a lot of um, uh, hugging and kissing and a lot of people coming around and um, we're already worried of course what will happen if there's more cases of COVID-19 and um, how can we address that and um, one of the things to do is to reach out to community um, leaders and um, people that are respected in these rights and frameworks and that can be community elders, women and men, um, religious leaders and to um, have a discussion with them to say okay so these are the issues what are your um, what are your suggestions to to um, address this um, I have an example from when I was working with interviews actually in uh, Cox's Bazaar and it was uh, Eid and uh, there was a lot of distress because um, people in the camps couldn't uh, celebrate Eid because they couldn't uh, or yeah, they couldn't slaughter an animal and um, and give part of that uh, as was the tradition to um, other people, to family members, to those less fortunate. And it really caused a lot of um, yeah mental uh, stress. And so what we did was to talk to different imams and have them actually explain that uh, this is a specific specific you know situation and if we go back to the Quran it says that um, if you you know aren't fortunate enough to be in a place where you can um, share your meals then it's enough to 
have a thought um, and and you can also share some lentils or you can um, share positive thoughts and um, that was a way where it's not coming from us saying you cannot do this or we're not going to give you the cow to slaughter but where we um, give the problem to the community and to to the relevant leaders and they are addressing it so it's about really um, engaging them and engaging them early so mapping out the calendar of what are the things that are happening um, what are the rituals that are important to people and discussing them now with um, relevant uh, community leaders who can then come up with solutions that fit that cultural framework work um, and it's the same with explaining COVID-19 like how first understanding how do people explain it and then how can we use that to to explain how to prevent it um, and uh, address that thanks thank you Vivian um, Celeste Julie do you want to add anything from the from your experiences in the field no. Maybe very quickly, just for the sake of time, um, yeah. just from, from a practical perspective, I would say that as a practitioner, your team should be 99% local. So that's going to be the first layer that will not ensure, but at least, uh, you know, um, facilitate communication with the community and, and, and help in making the, the messages adapted to the specific community. Uh, here in Somalia, we're very lucky to have very, very strong national and local teams. Um, so whenever we have a meeting uh, before coming up with a new awareness campaign, we will always discuss internally and, and they, will, they will be very vocal in telling you if something will work or something will not work. Uh, so having this like first layer of discussion with a team that is local, that knows very well the, the, the culture of the, of the community, that knows very well the, what practices are, are acceptable and what are not, for, for me it's, it's the key and it makes the work 99% uh, easier. And this doesn't mean that it's always going to be a success. Of course, communities are very diverse. Sometimes we think that because we call it community, uh, they are all the same, but uh, mm -hmm. communities are composed by individuals who are different. And so we also have to think always of this diversity within the community, which sometimes is not reflected in our own teams. So if that is the case, um, then of course we like we have to engage more early on uh, with different segments of the community. However, you define those segments uh, to make sure that that you identify the potential challenges early on, especially before starting a big uh, awareness campaign or risk communication campaign. Um, yeah. So I, I think those are the main points from from our perspective here in Somalia. Thank you, Celeste. Julie. Yes, just to uh, to add on Celeste and Viv, um, uh, one thing I would add is, you know, be, uh, building on, of course, uh, I like uh, Celeste uh, points of having a 99% uh, local team, definitely. I would say also uh, to make uh, the team uh, aware of um, their role of being humble and uh, respectful. And, yeah, my experience is uh, even though my teams are from the local community sometimes because they they have this specific role in you know talking on the radio and becoming like a radio star uh, or you know being active and their NGO workers they 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 tend to position themselves a bit as a, as an authority and they can um, you know sometimes make fun of um, rumors in front of the person who's, you know, saying something that doesn't, uh, you know, they already know it's wrong. Um, so I, I, I'm trying to work with them to, to say, you know, what is really important is that the person feel listened to and respected. Uh, try to humble uh, down and uh, put yourself in the shoes of your grandmother, for instance, you know, going back to basics on that. Um, because even if the team is from the community and they understand very well, um, the culture, uh, sometimes it's also uh, social positioning and um, they have to, to be careful with that one. That's it on my side. Thank you very much, uh, Julie. Um, unfortunately, we uh, went over, we exceeded the time we had planned, so we will have to um, finish here. Um, so we were planning to address a few more questions. Uh, we will also see the look into the, the, like, the questions in the chat. We can uh, address those bilaterally. 
Uh, also, before maybe closing this section, um, we have received some questions on the general role of CAM management agencies in the, in the COVID-19 response. So, although the core responsibilities of CAM management agencies do not change during this uh, response, the focus might be put in some of the core responsibilities. And, if we and as we have seen in this uh, webinar, some of the interventions need to be adapted due to health requirements, but also to limitations in accessing sites or social distancing measures. So in this regard, several guidance documents are, av are available. So the Global CCCM cluster compiles some documents and resources for CAM management agencies um, involved in the COVID response, which are available in the website of the Global CCCM cluster under the, the name Coronavirus Advi Advisory. Um, also, I'm sure you all uh, know about the Interagency Standing Committee uh, guidance, the interim guidance on scaling up COVID uh, related operations, which includes also CAMs and CAMs like settings. And then, third, the CCM cluster is uh, working on some guidelines and uh, frequent asked questions for CAM management organizations uh, on the COVID 19 response based on the collective experience and actions that are currently going on the field. So just to give you these, um, these resources that are already available um, for CAM management organizations. And I think this is all on my side. I really appreciate it uh, that you stayed with us for almost two hours. And I'm out and Ash, this is over to you. Hi, um, thank you so much, Amalia. Um, Thank you to our speakers and to our resource people and to the participants for sharing and for such an informative and participatory session on community engagement. As mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, um, for the month of April on Tuesdays, there will be different webinars on camp management in this time of COVID-19. The next webinar, will be on, sorry, I'm trying to, oh. the next webinar will be on remote engage, uh, capacity building. And this is organized by the Capacity Building Working Group of the Global CCCM cluster. As you can see in the slide, these are the, this is the information and that's the link. We will be uploading the slides online so you can have access to um, this information. Um, and these are the, um, following webinars that will take place in April. If you would like to have more information on, on these events, you can go to the Global Cluster website where the link is on the top and um, see a detailed view on these events. Um, for those who wanted to join the webinar, I, I did realize, I'm sorry, we did realize that after it hit 100, quite a few people could not join. And we apologize for this. We will be uploading a recording of the webinar to YouTube. And we will look at maybe using a different platform next time so that more people can join us for this webinar. The slides by Vivian and the video by IOM Somalia will be shared as well online. And what we will do is we will um, send you an email with where you can find all these different resources. Um, we will also be sending you a quick post webinar survey um, on how we can improve or what you found was the best um, or the most interesting aspect of the webinar. In this uh, survey, you can subscribe to the participation in displacement working group mailing list if that is what you would like. Um, so programming for community engagement and participa participation will need to be adapted or changed in the next few months to adapt to the situation of COVID-19. And um, sorry, yeah, and we hope this webinar has inspired everyone um, as it has inspired us as the topics this is discussed today will inform our group, uh, the work of the working group in the next couple of months. Before we end, um, we will also like to take this opportunity to mention that today is World Health Day. And with that in mind, we would like to end with some reflections brought in in the webinar. The health and protection needs of marginalized communities, particularly adolescents, persons with disabilities and elderly, among others, in the camp will be different from the overall camp population. As mentioned in our webinar today, community leadership plays a key role in camp life and ensuring the right information is disseminated. Participation is key in understanding the different needs of groups and with participation, communities can hold 
the CAT management agencies and their community itself accountable. It is essential to reflect, I remember that um, some, something in particular Vivian mentioned, which was that the community should be the driver, should be in the driver's seat in community engagement and in participation. And our role as community, um, as CAT management agencies is to ensure that this is reflected in both camp and camp light settings. As our speakers have shared, there are different ways to remotely and innovatively engage with camp population, and I hope that we can all take this back with us today. As you can see in the slide now, if you would like to email the working group, there are the email and the page, um, our website with the global cluster is available here. Um, the global CCCM cluster website is there, as well as the COVID-19 resource page, which has been prepared with uh, different guidance and notes. Um, furthermore, the Women in Displacement platform, uh, there's a link here where there is um, different resources on, on conducting baseline and line, which perhaps you can adapt to this uh, situation currently. And the last link is the IFRC Community Engagement Hub. So again, thank you all for attending and I hope everyone stays safe. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.